This is On the Market, a Bigger Pockets podcast presented by Fundrise. Hey everyone, welcome to On the Market. My name is Dave Meyer. I'll be your host, and I am joined by three wonderful panelists. First up, we have Henry Washington. Henry, what's going on? What's up, Dave? Glad to be here, man. Good to see you again. You too. We also have James Daner. James, how you been? Uh, I'm doing well. We we have a sunny day in October in Seattle, which is very rare. So it's a good day. Cherish it. I am. <laughs> Kathy, how are you? Probably sunny and enjoying Malibu because it's always nice. It's been foggy, but I'm, uh, you guys, I'm still recovering from BPCon. I don't know about you, but try, trying to keep up with all these youngsters. <laughs> <laughs> Kathy is completely lying, by the way. She was leading the charge. There's no way yes. you were hanging in with us. You were absolutely <laughs> driving all of the fun we had at BPCon. Oh, my goodness. Thank you. It was a blast. No one should ever miss that, ever. Yeah, it was it was super fun. We had an incredibly good time. Um, you can probably follow us all on social and see what happened. And you can join us next year. We actually announced that BPCon 2023 is going to be in Orlando next year. So um, definitely get tickets if you didn't next year this year because it was a really good time. Yeah. All right. So today we are going to talk about this. This show gives me a little bit of anxiety because we are going to try and make some forecasts about the 2023 housing market, which, you know, normally housing market years, it's not that hard to predict. It usually just goes up a little bit. But the last couple of years have gotten pretty tricky, but we're going to do it anyway, because even though none of us know exactly what's going to happen, this type of forecasting and discussion of sort of the elements and variables that go into housing prices could help all of us form a investing hypothesis for next year and make better investing decisions. Sound good to you guys? I should have grabbed my crystal ball. It's in the other room. <laughs> I know. Mine, mine is very broken right now, so unfortunately. <laughs> I think everyone's is broken. Yeah, exactly. If you all remember, if any of you are here or listeners to the show, for our very first show, we made some predictions and we decided that we were going to revisit those predictions. So since we're going to make our 2023 forecast, figure today is a good time to revisit our show and uh, and talk about how we did so far. So the first question I asked you all was rent growth. Do any of you actually remember what you said? Mine was easy to remember. It's seven and a half across the board on every. Oh, yeah. You were always <laughs> seven and a half percent. Okay. Yeah. Well, it looks like on this one, we actually did really well um, because when I was looking at the data for rent growth, I pulled two different ones apartment list, which tends to sort of index more on multifamily rents. Uh, and that came at 6.8%. So, Kathy, 7.5%. That's pretty, pretty good. Woo-hoo. Very good. And Jamil, who's not here, Um, so we'll just say he was wrong, but he did say 7%. He was, so he was pretty close. Um, but we also looked at Redfin, which is more single family and that is at 11% right now. And James, you said 10 to 12%. So I think you nailed that one right on the head. Henry at 10%, pretty close. And I said 12%. So I actually feel like we did pretty good on rent. James doesn't get to win. He picked multiple numbers. (laughs) That's true. (laughs) He was wrong twice, actually. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> Always put a range on things. There's the, the, the key. Actually, to, uh, Henry, I'm looking, actually, Henry, I'm looking at your answer to the next question, and you put a range on it. So. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like I'm the winner then. Um, <laughs> all right. So um, we are that, – that was pretty good. I think we did pretty well there um, on rent growth. Housing price growth, uh, James, you said, again, 10 to 12%. Henry, you copied James and said 10 to 12%. <laughs> I went first. <laughs> okay, yeah, James, you copied Henry. <laughs> and then, Kathy, you went seven and a half. Jamil went nine. I went six. And the answer right now is 7% year over year. So we're actually doing pretty good. I think, I'll, Kathy, you were the closest with seven and a half percent, only a half point off. So Kathy is winning here. Oh, and I should remind you that we also had bingo balls where we just randomly picked them. And bingo balls were at 3%. So it was not that the bingo ball did pretty good on housing price growth, but it did say negative 10% on rent growth. So yeah, don't, don't trust the bingo. bingo not ball. so close on that one. So we did pretty well, actually. This is better than I thought. Um, inflation. This 
is not as good. Uh, actually, you, you all did pretty well. So inflation, Kathy, you guessed, of course, 7.5%. Jamil was at 6. Henry at 7. James at 9. Me at 6. I guess I was the optimist of the group and was the most wrong, definitely. Uh, because as of August 2022, the CPI is at 8.2%. Not bad, though. We were all pretty close. And the year's not over yet, so we can still hope that comes down. That's true. It does look like it will come down. I, I was hoping Dave's number would be the number. It just didn't quite pan out that way. <laughs> yeah, I was opti- I was trying to manifest lower inflation. Because remember, we talked about this. Like The expectation of inflation impacts inflation. So if we just tell people inflation's going to go down, it will go down. <laughs> if we just say it's transitory, it will go down. <laughs> yeah, I guess that didn't really work. <laughs> All right. Well, I think we all did pretty well on these, actually. I'm surprisingly well. Um, Personally, even though I think the house price growth was like pretty close for a lot of us, I don't know about you. Personally, I felt like a little bit of my closest on that was luck. I did not think the housing market would go up as much as it did and then come down as much as it did. I thought it would sort of be more of a steady decline, but it did wind up sort of where I was thinking. Do do any of you have some like thoughts on on these predictions and where you went right or wrong? Well, the Fed was posturing back then and saying they were going to raise rates seven times. And honestly, I didn't believe they would. And ooh, they were serious and they still are. So yeah, uh, I, 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 I'm I, glad they have because double digit price growth is not good for anyone. Well, it's good for you if you own real estate, right? Not good for the buyer. So it's, it's a, it's, a healthier housing market would see would not see double digit returns every year. Yeah, I mean, I think these numbers are, are fairly, he- with the exception of inflation, I think these are fairly healthy numbers based on what we saw uh, in 2021 as far as uh, that exponential growth, which we obviously wasn't healthy. Um, so yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm pleasantly surprised, and um, the numbers don't bother me at all. Obviously, other than inflation, nobody likes high inflation. Yeah, the crazy thing is, is the housing market was, I think, up like 14% year over year in July, and now it's slid back pretty aggressively. And so, you know, I think if uh, they did say they were going to raise the rates seven times, but they also were saying a half point back then too, yeah, not yeah. three quarters point. I think that's what threw a lot of these predictions off is they, they switched the tune about 90 days after that show and everything has changed rapidly. Well, it's good. It keeps us in a job here. And now we still have a podcast to talk about this stuff because they're doing all this crazy stuff all the time. Predictions are getting harder and harder when it's so manipulated. Totally. So I am going to make you all go on the record and make a prediction later in the show. But first, I want to know, you know, we all know interest rates are going to be sort of one of the big variables um, for 2023. Kathy, what do you, are there any other like major variables that you would take into consideration when thinking about where the housing market's going in 2023? Well, I don't want to be uh, depressing, but yeah, there's a lot of things that could happen. <laughs> but I'm going to be depressed. You know, you got some people who are a little crazy that are trying to run the world. And, uh, you know, so, yeah, so there's some horrible things that could happen that would just destroy the housing market, quite literally. Uh, but we won't talk about that or think about that, right? Are you talking about Russia or something else? Well, yeah. <laughs> um, you know, the potential of uh, the, the nuclear threat, which, you know, hopefully somebody else has control of these things than just a couple of people who want to want to have world power. Let's hope. And it's silent. <laughs> <laughs> and we all get depressed. <laughs> Henry, what about you? What are, what are some of the variables that you're thinking about when you when you look forward to next year? Um, yeah, man. So this, you know, I, I think it's been described before as we're, as we're at this standoff. And I keep bringing it up because it seems so right. But it's not just a standoff between like interest rates and, um, and uh, inflation. And inventory for, for me, it's it's the confusing part is yes, interest rates rising is starting to slow the market down, but also supply and demand still says that we need more houses than we have, and so how do those two things interact with each other over the next twelve months? Because supply and demand would say housing prices need to go up because houses are in demand, but interest rates and inflation are saying well things are probably going to cool off. So seeing how those things, which are butting heads, play out is, is interesting. I'm, I'm, 
I'm I'm trying to watch. I'm watching Days on Market and I'm watching um, Inventory just to see, you know, uh, to to help me inform my buying decisions. Also to help me in determining like what I'm going to offer on a property because what's it going to sell for in 90 days when I'm done with the rehab versus what I think it might sell for now is is different. That's not something we've always had to take into consideration. So it's all interesting. It's it's all you can really do is try to stay. Stay as up to date on your market data as possible. It's like data has never been so much more valuable in the real estate market than it is right now because there's nothing else to rely on. Everything else is just, you know, we can't predict anything else. So you just kind of have to look at the data and make the best decision in that moment. That's well said. Yeah. I mean, it, it's, we've said that before on the show, but I feel like this is really, uh, Maybe we're tooting our own horn because that's what this podcast is about. But this is really sort of a, like a researcher's market. You know, it's for people who are informed. If you want to be in the market, you have to really be knowing what's going on um, in your individual market and sort of what the big macro uh, trends are going to be. Uh, James, what about you? Any Anything in particular um, new or anything uh, you, you want to you, you think is going to impact the market next year other than interest rates? I mean, I still think there could be some supply chain issues with all the conflicts go- globally going on that could really jeopardize things. I mean, if the energy keeps going up, there's going to be more. I mean, it's going to be harder for us to to battle inflation. It's so I think those are things to really look at, because at the end of the day, the Fed is raising interest rates to try to bring inflation down. But there's two factors in there. And if the global supply chain is still really expensive or energy is really expensive, it's going to it's going to really slow down the battle against inflation, which could lead to much higher rates. And so I'm definitely looking at all those things, because if we're the end goal, I think, is to get the CPI down to what, two and a half to three percent is where they kind of want to be at. We have a long ways to go and rates are only part of the solution. And so if if you know things that I'm really looking at is are how much money are they still printing because they have to slow that down because that's going to keep the inflation higher and then what's going on with the global supply chain. So just looking at those two things are things that I really am tracking because that's going to be half the battle with inflation and we have to get this inflation down to get rates more normalized. Yeah, it's a great point because ultimately inflation is up for a variety of reasons and the Fed can only impact one of the, I guess I would say like three major reasons, right? Like there's demand and easy like demand, which they're trying to call and they can affect by raising interest rates because people will spend less money, but they're not, they can't take money out of the system, right? Like, or I guess they could, but they're not, um, but they are slowing down that, that, that printing. So that's helping. But as you said, supply chain issues and some economists believe made up for it as much as half of the inflation that we're seeing right now, just because, especially in non-core CPI with like energy and food prices because of these uh, things. So it's like the Fed's raising rate and causing a lot of damage, but we don't even know if that's necessarily going to work. Yeah, that's the concern, right? Because in the 70s and early 80s, they had to do two things. It was, they had to, they caused two recessions during that time. One was to jack rates way up and where they got up as high as 21% to get it under control. The second was they wanted to get, unemployment up because it was down to zero like we are now and until they you know energy and all these things they're all all these bottlenecks add to the labor market and if they're trying to get that under control they got to look at everything not just rates and so watching the unemployment uh inflation rate those are two big key indicators of telling us how quickly the rates could come down or how quickly they could continue to rise which is that just affects the cost of money which slows everything down and so you really really do want to pay attention to that in your forecasting yeah the last jobs report or unemployment actually went down which is not what the fed wants it makes them real mad they want to kill jobs i know a million a million jobs were uh there's a million less jobs than there were, but still 10 million versus 11 million, still uh, two jobs for every person that wants them. So the Fed's not liking this strong economy right now. And it's like, how do we kill it more? Uh, so that's that's where we're at. And that's why the interest rate hikes were so aggressive, right? That's why we talked about it. They were three quarters of a point. The last, what, three in a row, three quarters of a point. And that wasn't what people expected, but I think it's because they weren't getting the results that they wanted. Like after the first, what, one or two, I think housing price growth was still going up nation nationwide. Right. Um, and like I said, a lot of that might be because, you know, supply and demand is still saying we need the home. So I think they're going to continue to be aggressive, man. That's 
That's, that's scary. Yeah. I mean, I feel like we should all just agree not to spend money for like one month. Like everyone stay inside. Let's do like that's another lockdown. Solution. Let's do another lockdown. No one spend money for a month. Just self-imposed. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Every provider put everything on sale 8.2% for the next month. And that will bring prices down 8.2%. And we'll all be fine after that. Just, just, we can do this if we just all stop spending for, I love that, 30 days. Just wait. Yeah, exactly. But we just locked up $14 million in deals. So we just can't. We just oh, can't. You just can't. <laughs> You're causing inflation, James. This but, is your fault. But the, but the pricing's well below 8% than what it was six months ago. So it's, it, we're, we're, hel- we're helping deflate the assets at the same time. Well, it, something I saw recently that I, I uh, was a little terrified by was that they, someone did some analysis, I think it was Larry Summers, that basically said that there hasn't been a time when inflation decreased until the core, the, until the Fed funds rate was higher than core inflation. Oh, boy. Um, and so right now, you know, there's two, two inflation numbers. One that you hear is 8.2%. That includes food and energy, but that's really volatile. What most economists, what the Fed looks at is usually the core inflation rate, which strips out the volatile parts and just takes the more stable parts. And that's still, I think, at like 6.3%. So that's really scary because they're saying like the only time inflation goes down is if we got that Fed funds rate, which is right now at 3.25%. So it's saying it could go up, up to 6%. Um, if that doesn't stop coming down. And I don't, I think that's like sort of a worst case scenario. But to me, that just signals that the Fed is, is not going to, to pivot anytime soon. Um, and until there's definitely a, be- a, a significant, uh, recession in my mind. So, um, I think we should all be expecting, uh, high interest rates next year. Does anyone disagree on that? When you say uh, interest rates, are you talking about mortgage or are you talking about the overnight lending? So, both, I guess. So I would say that like the, the the thing about inflation I was just talking about was the Fed funds rate. They're saying that the Fed funds rate has to get above core CPI. Um, but yeah, I do expect mortgage rates to be pretty high then too. Yeah. I mean, it, it's it's interesting because Freddie Mac, they obviously know something about interest rates. They're predicting that they'll go down next year. Yeah, I saw that. Mm-hmm. And and that's usually because it's it's tied to the 10-year treasury and what investors are wanting. If investors want safety, they buy the 10-year treasury and they, they buy mortgage-backed securities. And if they think that we're going to see a lot of inflation continued, then they're going to buy treasuries. I mean, um, yeah, you know, they're going to buy stocks and things that inflate. So if if again if Freddie Mac thinks that mortgage rates are actually going to be coming down next year, uh, that means that more and more people are going to be looking for safety in in uh you know in in bonds and mortgage backed securities and anyway it's it's a very confusing and inverted when you look at it that way, but when Freddie Mac I, I'm I'm in the same boat because I do think that. Eventually, if we're looking at year over year data, we know that inflation was pretty high last fall. So when we're looking year over year by the end of this year, it's maybe going to not look so bad. I mean, at least that's what I'm hoping. If that's, if that's the case and investors think that inflation will start to come back and it, you know, commodities are coming down. Big time. Not obviously where you are in in Europe, but they are coming down. Yeah, I'm 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 hoarding firewood to start burning for the winter. <laughs> yeah, yeah. In Europe, I can't even imagine what you guys are going through. But here in the housing in the in the construction world, I mean, I just got some of our properties rebid, and it is hundreds of thousands of dollars cheaper. So costs have definitely definitely come down, and hopefully, we'll see more of that. Yeah, I didn't understand how Freddie and uh, Freddie Mac was going to predict that they were going down because they predicted they would be down to five two about six months in, about at, at the, the third quarter. But that means that the Fed would be dropping the rate by a point from where we are today. But they said that they have two more three quarter point hikes, and so I'm like, so the the math doesn't add up for that prediction. It's if they're going up another point and a half to where they are now, that means in in about nine months, they would have to drop it about two and a half points back down, which I don't see that happening. And so that that's why it is so confusing. Like, why would that, how did they come up with that? 
That or they think that we're going to go into a very nasty, deep recession and we have to repair it real quick. I mean, that would be the only prediction indicator at that point. But I I, I cannot figure out the logic behind that prediction. Well, I I was actually curious about this um, and did a little bit of an analysis. But I think I think Kathy's right. Um, One is that, first of all, just a reminder that the Fed funds rate is not mortgage rates. Fed The mortgage rates are more correlated to the 10-year treasury, which is just a U.S. government bond. Um, and bond prices um, or bond yields um, do tend to drop when there is demand for them. So like when, you know, investors in Europe, for example, they're not finding a yield, they put a lot of money into U.S. treasuries and that Push, pushes down the yields, and that would push down mortgage rates as an example. But James, one thing I looked at because I was really curious is there is a very there is basically a spread between a ten year bond yield and a mortgage rate, and it's usually one hundred and seventy basis points. And what this means for everyone listening to this is basically like when you're an investor, if you're a bank, you can choose to buy a government bond for let's say four percent. Um, and that's about the safest investment that you can make in the world because the U.S. government has to date always paid its debts um, and it's very reliable. The bank could then choose to lend you to you uh, for your mortgage, but they're going to charge you more because you're less reliable and there's higher risk. And so they need a higher reward for that. And the spread between the, the bond yield and a mortgage tends to be about 170 basis points. Right now, it's at 220 basis points. So it's significantly higher. And I think that's due to short term like volatility. And this is just my hypothesis. But I think maybe the Freddie and some I think Mark Zandi from Moody said they was going to go down too, are starting to say that like maybe once the Fed sort of like stays on this predictable course and they become believable that that spread between bonds and mortgage rates start to come down. Yeah, it seems like uh, many of the companies just priced it in because they said they're going to raise two more times and next year too. So, um, you know, if, if you're going to be lending to someone at a five-year fixed or seven or 10 year, you probably want to get ahead of what you think things might be at. So that, that does seem to be what's happened. But remember in July, uh, the, the Fed was raising rates and yet mortgages went down and the Fed did not like that. And they're like, all right, come on, we're going to kill this economy. <laughs> we're going to, we're going to raise rates more because we don't want to see that. Uh, because that's, that's investors saying, yeah, we think all this rates, all these rate hikes are going to slow down the economy. You are going to get what you want. And so maybe the safe place for us right now is these bonds. So yeah, we'll see. <laughs> I do believe that I, I don't think that rates will go up to eight, nine, ten percent like some people think. I hope you're right. <laughs> and hope I hope everyone's following this because it is like wonky, but this is actually a really important conversation because I think people assume that as the Fed raise rates, that mortgage that the federal funds rate, that mortgage rates rise linearly. And that is not true. It is much more correlated to the bond market. And as Kathy said, the mortgage companies aren't waiting around for the Fed to raise rates. Like they know it's coming. And so they're going to price it in well ahead of time. And so they're pricing in what they think is going to happen six months or a year, even more down the road. Um, and so if, as long as it stays predictable, I don't think we'll see a linear rate. Um, so let's get off this topic and we're going to take a quick break. But then after that, I'm going to make you all make forecasts for next year. Uh, so we'll take a quick break and we'll be right back. All right. We are back and it's time to make these very frightening predictions for the 2023 housing price. Who is bold enough to go first? <laughs> Henry, I'm looking at you, man. Absolutely not. <laughs> are we talking rates? No. I want you to guess year over year, one year from today. Where are we? What day is this? It's October 12th. One year from today, year over year housing market prices on a national level. Where are we going to be right now? We are at about 7% from 2021 to 2022. Where are we going to be in 2023? What do you got, James? Uh, so I, I I do believe that we are going to slide steadily backwards and that we're going to be looking at about a 9% drop. We've just seen too much appreciation. I think, you know, we were up, what, no, nearly 10, 12% last year. And then from 2018 to 2020, we saw over 30% growth in home prices. And so the growth has just been too large. And I, I, I think it's going to pull back. And we're going to see about a 10% to uh, year over year drop, 9 to 10% year over year drop from where we are at today. All right. Henry, I'm going to make you answer this. No, I mean, I, I want to answer it. I think that's, a, I mean, 
I think that's aggressive. Maybe it's because you're you're the Seattle market is the one having the the largest pullback right now compared to to the rest of the markets in the country. Uh, and so you're, but not joking, right? You're feeling it more than everybody else is, right? Because you're so heavily invested in that market. Uh, it, it, where I'm the opposite, we're still seeing rent. We're still seeing, sorry, uh, we're still seeing home price growth here, right? So, um, I don't know. I think on a national scale, it's probably going to come down, but I don't know. Five percent, I feel like it's still even a lot, but that's that's my guess. Wow. So if I came in around seven and a half, I'd be right between <laughs> you and your. <laughs> I'm going to stick with my seven and a half. I played this game on car rides, you guys. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't there a movie about that? Like the number 24, number 23, where it's like everything comes down to that number. That's that's you, Kathy. <laughs> there it is. Seven and a half. Um, and, you know, I'm I kind of don't care what the national number is. I, I really don't care because, I, you know, look at Henry. He's like, I don't care. You know, I, I, I'm not in those markets that are going to have a pullback. If you, if you got into Boise or Austin or Seattle a year, two years ago, you made a lot of money and some of that's going to get pulled back. It's not the worst thing in the world for the person who owns the home because if you hold it long enough, it'll it'll rebound eventually. Um, it's obviously really hard for people who are trying to sell right now better price your property right. But if you are in markets, I mean, Tampa is another market where prices went up a lot, but there's still so much demand. They're not really seeing the pullback uh, that that some of the other cities are that that saw such massive gains over the last year. Kathy, you're absolutely right. And we do want to allow you to have your public service announcement that there is no national housing market, which is true. You're absolutely right. But just to clarify, because I have to hold you to this, was that a positive seven and a half percent? It was a negative, or a negative seven. Negative seven and a half, seven and a half percent. Percent. Okay, nationwide. Just making sure. Nationwide. And then I think that's going to come from certain areas going down 20%. Totally. Uh, where other er- areas might go up a little or stay flat. Uh, but overall, it, it yeah, I think it'll be a national number will be negative. So let's say seven and a half percent, because I'm right in the middle. And it's a safe place. One, one thing that... that- I think everyone should know is typically when housing starts sliding backwards, the more expensive markets actually kind of start going first. And then it does catch up across the board because at the end of the day, rates are up going to be up like 75% of cost of money from they were 12 months ago. And it's just something to pay attention to because when money gets increased that rapidly, nothing is protected. I mean, they're doing that on purpose. If they're trying to put the, us into a recession, it's going to have impact across the board. Because it, it, Seattle used to be a more affordable market. We were actually one of the always one of the last markets to get hit. You know, like in 2008, we were one of the tail end uh, areas to start deflating. But now it's became an expensive market. So we were one of the first to go off. So always check the trends in your historical trends too in your neighborhoods. What Kathy said was a completely right. Look at where you're investing, not the national. National will throw it way off. And then just check those trends, see what it's done in other prior recessions during that time, and it will kind of give you some predictability. And then just check the growth. If the growth was rapid, it's probably going to come back a little bit quicker. Well said. And and there's never been more data available for people, too. Like, you can go on just regular websites like Zillow or Redfin or Realtor.com and see what's happening in your market in terms of inventory, days on market, pricing. Um, so there's really no excuse not to do it. It's free. And you can get a lot of this information right there um, and, and look up just what Kathy and James are saying. I think what throws a wrench in those plans, though, is that there's going to be less competition out there, but there's still going to be people who can afford to buy single family homes. And there's still going to be a shortage of those homes. And so even though the interest rates are higher, there's still going to be a subset of people who can afford to pay those interest rates and who are going to want to buy homes because they can get a little bit better price and there's less competition out there, which is going to help the sales numbers. I, it's such a great point. 552,000 homes sold in August. You know, We're still on track for for 5 million, over 5 million this year, which was kind of the average over the last decade if you take out COVID. So we're, sale, homes are still selling. You know, they're, they're, it's definitely down from the crazy frenzy of the last couple of years, but it's sort of down to somewhat normal. Would you guys agree with that? Absolutely. I think as soon as mortgage rates stop, like get a little bit more stable, people will do it. It's just like every day, it's just so volatile right now. I think that probably is people a little afraid. 
But at some point, people are going to have to get used to it because I personally, I think even if the Fed starts cutting rates, we're not going down to four percent again anytime soon. I mean, no. we're going to have to live with something in the fives, um, probably. Um, so I, I think people are just going to have to get used to it at some point and start buying again. Mm-hmm. Okay, I am going to make my guess. It's right in the middle. I mean, it's there's not that much variance. I think we all sort of think it's kind of the same thing. So I'm going to just go with six percent. And since so Jamil's not here, six percent negative. Six percent negative. Yes, I definitely okay. think that national housing market's going down. I'm going to give Jamil a positive twelve percent as his <laughs> as his estimate because he declined to be here, and he's on the record saying he thinks the housing market's going on twelve percent. Um, all right. Well, that that's all fun. As Kathy and uh, Kathy said, like, listen, it, the housing, the national housing market, totally agree. It's it doesn't really matter. It's like sort of for the the headlines, and it is fun to sort of just guess and 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 see how we do on these things. But um, I'm curious in in moving on to some more sort of anecdotal things that you all are thinking about. I want your hot take for 2023. This can be about the housing market, the economy, the state of the world. What's like a unique thing that you think is going to happen next year that will impact the the uh, the lives of investors? I guess I would say. Anyone want to go first? Oh my gosh, I'll jump in. Yes, Kathy, you say? go. Oh, you yeah. guys, you guys, you got to understand. You you understand the difference between a seller's market and a buyer's market, and and people don't they they mess this up all the time buying in a seller's market and selling in a buyer's market. And oftentimes I'll talk to a room and say, do you know what a seller's market is? And they'll say, yeah, it's a great time to buy. And, you know, so I just want to be super clear that a seller's market means the seller has the power. They can do whatever they want. They can put a house on the market with nothing fixed, with all kinds of problems and say, you know what? Um, you don't even get to do inspections. This is the price and then get people overbidding. That's a seller's market. The seller has the power. That's what we've had for two years. It was a tough market. If you're a savvy investor, you could still work around that. But man, if you were flipping houses, what a time. You've got the power. If you're a home builder, like we've been Wow. Got people lining up for your homes. It is shifting. It's shifting to a buyer's market. And this is the time to buy. And it's so funny because people are freaking out. It's like, it's your turn. It's <laughs> <laughs> such you know, a good way to put it. <laughs> it's, it's, if you're buying, you know, if you've bought and you're holding on and, and, you know, rents are solid, you're good. You know, this is the time to get in there and not have all that competition. You have the power you get to negotiate. It's a, it's a, you know, a buyer's market. I don't know how long that'll last because I do think eventually the Fed's going to get what they want. They're going to slow things down and that's going to, uh, again, bring potentially mortgage rates down. I really think they will not, not lower than 5%, maybe slightly, or if you pay points, but as soon as those rates come down, what do you think is going to (laughs) happen? People are going to come pouring in again as buyers. So you have this window to take advantage of what might be a small opportunity to to play in a buyer's market as a buyer. I love it. That's a very well good way to put it, Kathy. Yeah, I think it's it's just crazy that people are like yearning for what was going on last year. Like no one wanted to buy last year. And now they're like, oh, but interest rates are high and now it's going down. It's like everyone was complaining about it last year. So like, are you ever, like I think a lot of people are just scared to get in the market at all. Um, and, and that's the problem. But as Kathy said, good opportunity right now. Henry, what's your hot take? Uh, my hot take is surprise, surprise, uh, me being a single family and small multifamily investor. I think single family homes become a very, very hot commodity and something everybody wishes they kept more of or could get at the prices they're able to get them at right now because of the supply and demand issues. So you look at the interest rate hikes and you look at inflation. At some point, I think those things either level out, maybe start to come down. I don't know if it does in this year, but at some point that's what's, it, it'll, it, it'll become normalized, right? Like you said, that people will continue to buy. But our supply and demand problem didn't get fixed through all of this, right? There's still a need for housing. I got approached by a hedge fund just last week asking me if I had any deals, anything in this area that I would be willing to sell them, right? And I think their thought is the same, is that these single-family homes are going to be in in need and that uh, over the next 
I, I think a year is tough to predict to, to say, but over the next couple of years, I think definitely um, they're going to be uh, more valuable and in a commodity that a lot of people want to be able to get their hands on. And you're right, Kathy, like this, it's your time to buy. And so we are doing just that we're buying and I'm more bullish on single family homes than I have been in the past. I've typically been flipping all of my single families, but even, just today we closed on literally right before this, I had my, t- my title, uh, my title company here in my office and we closed on a single family home that we're going to keep. Um, and we may start to look more aggressively at not flipping all of the singles and keeping them. Um, because the people who own, the single family homes are going to be in the best position to make the profit as well as um, the interest rates right now. There are some people who aren't buying maybe because they can't, maybe because they just won't, don't want, maybe because they don't want to, but then they have to live somewhere. So they're renting and rents are still doing well here. And so I think owning that single family home, you're going to be able to get outstanding rents and uh, I think it's going to be a more valuable asset to everyone than it seems that it is right now. All right. I like it. James, what do you got? Something controversial, maybe? So I think um, 2023 is going to be a pretty big shock year for people. And I, I, I'm actually predicting that defaults are going to be extremely high. Really? Uh, not percentage-wise, and, and But in a different sector, I actually think it's going to be in the investment sector, not the residential homeowner sector. I think over the last 12 to 24 months, we've seen a lot of uh, FOMO and greed in the investment space. And there's been a lot of purchasing of bad assets or assets that had artificial performance. And, and what's going to happen is if the market corrects down, which I believe will happen, you're going to see people needing a bail out of these deals because they had bad practices. They did bad, they rushed investments. They were packing performance because they just wanted to get into the market. And I do think there is going to be a graveyard of investment properties and opportunities out there. And that's really what we're gearing up to buy. We're actually gearing up to buy half finished town home sites, fix and flip projects that are red tagged and stuck in, in uh, a tour apart. And I think you could see in the short term rental market, people walking away from properties because they were putting three and a half percent down in markets for all for the appreciation. And and, and those, those investment engines are slowing down. The, the high yield investments right now are not yielding the same growth, right? Flipping is not doing that well. Development is not doing that well on, on the margins. And, and a lot of markets, short term rentals are down too. these high yield investments are going to deflate backwards. And I don't think people uh, accounted for that or, you know, they had all stars in their eyes rather than balanced look at portfolios. And I think this is going to be a massive opportunity for investors to purchase bad investments that need to be restabilized and turned into profitable ventures. Um, I, I think this is going to be a big deal in the next 12 months. And mm-hmm. I know personally I am geared up for it and gearing up for it because it's just the writing's on the wall for a lot of people. Uh, bad underwriting, greedy underwriting, bad plans, and that equates to an in, expensive money in a lot of these deals. That creates a recipe for disaster. But they will need to be purchased, and that's where investors are going to have a lot of opportunity. If they have the right plans, right systems in play, and the right capital in the door, there's going to be a lot of opportunity out there. A hundred percent. All right. Yeah. Multifamily particularly. Yeah. I just – there was just insane underwriting. Oh, talk about stacking performance. They were just stacked. People were just pumping every little yield into these deals – and it, and if you do it that way, that's where the risk is, and it's going to hurt on the way out the door. It just you know if it, it, it's all market time into that point, and you have missed the market. It is that 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 game is over. That's really interesting because when you, yeah, when you said that you were going to see for for a lot of defaults, I was kind of surprised because when you look at home buyer positions, like American home buyers are pretty good position to service their debt right now. But what you're saying makes total sense. There's a lot of people who got pretty greedy. I mean, we did that show a couple months ago. Kathy, you said you were looking at two multifamily, right, syndications that were just like crazy with the, some of the assumptions that we're making. And that was after, you know, that was like people were still doing those types of deals, even after the writing was sort of on the wall and you could see that the market yeah. was sort of changing gears. It's still happening. It's it's still happening. I mean, on, on this last one, uh, again, I won't say who it is, but it's somebody who's on a lot of podcasts and they were using, <laughs> um, I don't know if you know. And their initials is, are. But, <laughs> um, but yeah, and and when we underwrit it, underwrit is that a word? Underwrote uh, it. They were using the reserves as 
as like a return, not a return, a return on capital, not even a return of. What? Uh, like basically saying that was profit. And and like, well, first of all, you're, you've got reserves set aside because you're probably going to need them. If you have an older bil- building, I guarantee you're going to need those reserves. <laughs> but, to, but to put them in the pro forma as as if it's profit, I, I, oh boy. You know, I was just like, oh boy. <sighs> yeah. It'll be interesting. Wow. Uh, yeah, James. So, so that, uh, actually, uh, goes well with my, my take. And I was sort of going to be a little bit more specific. I think there is going to be, I've said this a little bit. I think there is a storm brewing in the short term rental market specifically. If you look at the way those markets grew, it was even faster. Like not, not necessarily saying short term rentals in cities, but like in vacation hotspots have gone absolutely crazy over the last couple of years. We saw demand for second homes go up 90%. So that combined with the increased demand from investors just sent those prices through the roof. Like you said, people put 3.5% down and they were. We're, we're seeing sort of this perfect storm where the supply of, of, of short-term rentals has continually gone up. I think it was up like 20% year over year. So there's way, way more short-term rentals than there have ever been at a point where if we hit a recession and we continue to see these, these uh, inflation that's hurting people's spending power, where discretionary spending like things and going to a short-term rental is probably going to go down. And so you could see the whole industry have more supply but less revenue, and that could put really people in a bad spot. And I'm not saying this is going to be everyone. I think you know people who, have, who are experienced operators, people who are, have good, unique properties that stand out can still do well. But I personally believe there's going to be very good opportunity in these markets over the next couple of years, like James said. Um, and so I, I'm excited about that. The other thing I think that's happening in the short term rental market that is sort of this like slow moving freight train is like all the regulation that's going on in, in short term rentals. More and more big cities are starting to regulate uh, like Dallas just regulate. I think Atlanta is starting to put in regulations. And I think that trend is really going to continue. And we're going to see a sort of an erosion of opportunity in the big cities. Um, people who have grandfathered in will probably do really well because there's going to be constrained supply. But I think that's that's going to be a really uh, interesting thing to watch. Um, if more and more, you know, if housing prices stay this high, more and more municipalities are probably going to be tempted to try and solve the housing problem with regulating short-term rentals, which makes no sense to me, but I think they'll try and do it anyway. Well, I mean, it, 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 it might make no sense in, in some smaller, but like we just got back from San Diego. I mean, there's tons and tons of Airbnbs out there and they're starting to you know, I- impose more restrictions. The same reason why Atlanta's doing it is because tons of people were buying property. They're turning them into Airbnbs and there's, again, there's a supply and demand problem, right? And so the best way they can think to get more housing on the market the quickest is, right, you impose these these you know taxes and rules and things and allowing only allowing people to have a certain amount of Airbnb property that they own and that frees up housing almost immediately. Uh, it, you know, is it is it the best move, the right move? I don't I don't know. I'm not, that's not for me to say, but it is absolutely happening. And that, that's why I think people need to be careful. And just kind of like as an education piece, we're not saying that like Airbnb is bad. Don't do it. I always I always say like. If you're going to buy an Airbnb property, you want to be able to buy it and have more than one exit in the event that some regulations change. Right. We just bought a property that we're we bought solely to use as Airbnb, but we also bought it at a point where if we renovate it and we don't get the return that we want, we can sell it and still make a profit. Right. So I have two exits there. Um, but not everybody's doing that, especially what we saw over the last year and a half to two years is people had all this extra money. They didn't have all these restrictions on where they had to live. They started buying second properties and Airbnbs and all different places. And they weren't really evaluating like what the numbers were going to do if they didn't have to do it, use it as an Airbnb, if they had to pivot and do something else, because they were just like, well, it's appreciating. It'll appreciate it. It'll be fine. And that's not what we're seeing anymore. So just be careful about the markets you're investing in and be careful about the numbers and have more than one exit. Cause if you've got a second exit and that exit is positive, then you're fine. 
Yeah, a great hack around that, by the way, is buying uh, short-term rentals just outside of that perimeter of where they'll be illegal. That's what we have. We're two houses away from where those rules are. So, you know, we're, we're, we're still slower. It's definitely still slower right now. Um, and then also, if you are stuck with a short-term rental that's not performing and you're upside down, uh, really consider some of the shared vacation ownership because it makes vacation home uh, purchases really cheap if you split it between eight owners. And uh, and some municipalities don't want that either because then you've got all these vacation homes with multiple owners. But again, if you just stay right outside the city perimeter, uh, then you usually allowed you're usually allowed to do it. That's good advice. And and places that need it to to survive the economy. I think Avery said that on a recent show too. It's like if you're in a you know a tourism dependent destination, like you know I have a I have a Airbnb in a in a ski town where there's very few hotels, which kind of makes no sense. But like they need. To, to drive the economy, they absolutely need short term rentals. And so while they've raised taxes, which is fine, you know, like they, you know, they're not eliminating it. Um, but just just to want to say, Henry, like I, I get the the logic of why they're doing it. But short term rentals, even though it's gone up so much, make up less than one percent of all the housing stock in the U.S. So it's like it could help, but it's like it, it's a short term fix. And maybe it will help short term, but it's not going to like address the long term issues, structural issues with with housing supply in the U.S. That's hotel lobbyist money going to work. <laughs> so <that is. laughs> Hotels don't like yeah. losing money. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. It's the Hilton. The Hilton. Air, right. Airbnb needs their own lobbyist. Oh, I bet they do. Bet I'm sure they have lot. it. <laughs> All right. Well, we could talk about this all day, and I'm sure throughout the next year, we will be talking about the 2023 housing market. But we do have to wind this down because, Kathy, we have a we have a special request of you. A oh. listener reached out with a question just for you, which we will get to after this quick break. All right. Well, Kathy, you are on the hot spot. You're in the hot seat right now. We had a, a listener named Gregory Schwartz reach out and said, this question is in the title. The title was, will increasing 10-year treasury yields, we talked about this a little bit, decompress cap rates? And I'll let you explain that, Kathy. But he said, the question's in the title. I'd like to hear from the panel, but mostly Kathy Fecky, you're the favorite. <laughs> I believe she mentioned something about this relationship in the most recent podcast. I read an article that the historical average spread between 10-year cap rate and multifamily, 10-year yield, excuse me, and multifamily cap rate has been 2.15%. Kathy, enlighten us. Well, it's a it's such a good question because if you could get four or five percent, if wherever the ten year ends up, uh, that's like you said earlier, that's a pretty safe bet. You're, you've got the U.S. government backing your investment, uh, and they haven't failed yet. Uh, so if you fi- if somebody's got, I think I think at one of the conferences I was at, someone was selling a two cap in Houston. So that's going to be a lot harder to sell. Basically, a cap rate is like a, a, a multiple. It's it's a it's a formula that does a lot of things in commercial real estate. But basically, it helps you understand like how much revenue or income you're buying as a ratio to to your expense. So basically, the easiest one is like a ten cap, right? If you're buying ten cap, you're basically getting. Uh, it will take you 10 years to repay that investment. If you get a five cap, it will take you 20 years to repay your investment, generally speaking. And so um, when cap rates are low, that's good for a seller because they're getting way more money. When cap rates are high, it's good for a buyer because they're buying more income for less money relatively. Um, So that's, I think, what they're asking. And just, just generally speaking, cap rates are very low right now. Um, and no one sets cap rate. It's sort of like this market dependent thing where just like a single family home, a, a seller and a, and a buyer sort of have to come to agreement. And right now, I don't know what the average cap rate is in the country. Um, it, it really depends market to market, it depends on the asset class. It depends on, uh, you know, competition, what rents are. It depends on all these things. But generally speaking, they're pretty low right now. Just like everything, it's sort of been a, a seller's market. And so my 
guess is that what Gregory's asking, right? Is like, will it become more of a mar- Will it become more of a buyer's market in the multifamily space? Yeah, and that's what's what I was saying earlier is is exciting. Is when you're in a seller's market and everybody's bidding for the same property and prices go up, your return goes down. Your your cash flow is down. So for the past few years, it's been really hard to find properties that cash flow or the, the cash flow has definitely gone down, and that's kind of the cap rate has gone down. Uh, as in single family, at least, as prices come down, generally, then you have more cash flow, except the interest rate is a problem. So I I would say that in commercial real estate, the biggest factor to focus on is the interest rate, because generally that is tied, that if if interest rates go up, your NOI, your 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 um, your return goes down, and uh, and that will you know, affect pricing more. So I think more commercial investors are worried that cap rates will increase, which again, if you're a buyer, that's great. But if you're trying to sell, that's awful. If you bought it uh, at a low cap rate, which is a high price, you got to sell it (laughs) at a higher cap rate. It's a lower price. You're going to take losses. And we're seeing that in the market right now. Like, you know, locally in, in Washington, it we're, we're apartment buyers. We typically have been buying 20 to 30, 40 units at a time. That's kind of the space we've had to hang out in because the big hedge funds have been buying these properties. Like if it was above 40, 50 units, the hedge funds were buying. They were buying at like a three cap, which is bizarre to me. I don't I don't understand why anybody would want a three cap. But as the as the rates have increased and their cost of money has increased, and now the bonds that they can also redeploy into and get a, a good return – We've seen them really dry up, and I mean, it's it, we just recently locked up an eighty unit, and we got a five seven cap or five six to five seven cap on that, which was not in existence the last twenty four months. So the cap rates are definitely getting better, especially in the bigger spaces. We've been getting good cap rates in the small value add for the last ten years in our local market, but we had to put in a lot of work to get it there. Now we can buy a little bit cleaner in that space because it's less competitive. And the opportunities are definitely there. uh, Because again, we could not touch that product. Um, You know, I think that the property that we're in contract on, it was it was pending twice prior to the rates really spiking for two and a half to $3 million more than we're paying for. And so as, as the rates come up, pricing comes down, gives way more opportunities out there. And then also to think about, too, the debt coverage service ratios are changing rapidly right now, too. And so investors have to leave a little bit more capital in the game, too. So it's, it's really slowing everything down, but it's, it's creating a lot better opportunity and a way healthier market to invest in because you should not be getting into a three cap, or at least that's my firm. Yeah, I just it's crazy. It's insane. <laughs> it's disgusting. Yeah. It grosses me out. I don't know. I just, it's not, <laughs> like, earn some money, you know, but now the, the investments are more balanced and they're there to, to buy, which is great. Generally, I think like, yeah, there's a lot of factors that go into the cap rate that something trades for. But I think generally speaking, they're going to expand and it's going to become more of a buyer's market. But it, we have to remember that multifamily, at least multifamily, uh, or ex- excuse me, that um, commercial, specifically multifamily is not, it's, it's based off rents. And if rents keep going up, I don't think we're going to see cap rates expand too much. I mean, they probably will just because of interest rate, but there probably will still be fair demand from investors if if rents keep going up because it's still going to be one of the better, more attractive options in real estate, I think. And that's going to be a big if because Yardi Matrix just came up and said uh, rents were unchanged. Mm-hmm. And then apartment list said they were actually declines. Did so, they? Mm-hmm. Okay. Mm-hmm. That's really good because we had a production meeting before this, and that's going to be one of our upcoming shows. We were, I, I saw some headlines about that, and we're going to do some research and dig into that. So thanks, Kathy. All right. Well, Kathy, great job. Henry, James, also great job. I guess we're, we're not as cool. We don't get the specific questions asked for us. But uh, it's okay. I'm, I'm not that offended. Um, but... Thank you all for being here. This was a lot of fun. We're going to we'll we'll come back to this and and check out how our predictions and forecasts did in about a year. Um, but in the meantime, it'll be very fun to, uh, or at least very interesting, I don't know about there fun, go. to see what happens over the next couple months. And obviously for everyone listening, we will be coming to you twice a week, every week with updates on the housing market. Before we go, 
If you like On the Market, if you are so impressed by our incredible foresight and ability to predict the future, please give us a five-star review. We really appreciate that either on Apple or on Spotify. And we would love if you share this with a friend. If you have know someone who's interested in real estate investing, someone who just wants to buy a house and is trying to understand what's going on in the housing market, please share this podcast, share the love. Uh, we work really hard to get this out to all of you. We know that uh, a lot of you at BPCon were telling us how much value you get from it. So share the love with your friends in your community as well. Kathy, Henry, James, thanks a lot. We appreciate you. I'll see you all soon. On the Market is created by me, Dave Meyer, and Kaylin Bennett. Produced by Kaylin Bennett. Editing by Joel Esparza and Onyx Media. Copywriting by Nate Weintraub. And a very special thanks to the entire Bigger Pockets team. The content on the show On the Market are opinions only. All listeners should independently verify data points, opinions, and investment strategies. <laughs>